John Hess from Filmmaker IQ on the last frame rate video. I dared ask the question, what is the frame rate of the human eye? 10 frames per second with a lot of asterisks. I made a lot of people angry with that one. Now I wanna flip that question away from biology and ask what frame rate would you need to create motion on a screen that would be indistinguishable from reality. In other words, what frame rate would we need to completely eliminate all artifacts caused by discrete frame rates? Too long didn't watch, it's in the neighborhood of 20,000 frames per second. But hold up, how did we get here? In the last video, I was claiming the human eye had a frame rate of 10 frames per second. Again, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The eye doesn't have a frame rate, but certain biological responses have the tendency around 10 hertz. And of course, add in flicker fusion around 60 hertz. But now I'm saying to mimic reality, you need 20,000 hertz? Well, the confusion might come to the fact that a lot of people really don't understand exposure and frame rate. They tend to treat it as a number like your height without understanding the implications of the eye, which is a continuously exposing device that doesn't discreetly sample in a strict, regulated and precise interval like a frame rate. But I digress. For the purposes of this discussion in this video, the frame rate of the eye does not actually matter at all. In my last video, I demonstrated how a camera shooting a objective 24 frames per second could visually tell the difference when wiggling a mouse on a 60 hertz monitor versus a 144 hertz monitor. The frame rate you need to simulate reality has nothing to do with the temporal frame rate of the measuring device, be it a human eye or a camera with an actual frame rate. Instead, it has everything to do with the spatial resolution of the measuring device. That's right, when it comes to frame rate, it's not about time and the fourth dimension, as it is about the everyday, in our case, two-dimensional spatial reality of the screen. Let's build this up from the beginning. I need to keep repeating this because it's too easy to forget this. Nothing on your screen is moving. All screens are a succession of still images, each one a little bit different from the previous one. Now, what if we wanted to simulate something with no motion on the screen, a completely static image? What frame rate would we need to simulate looking at a still photo? Well, none. A screen holding an image is the same thing in essence as holding a printed photograph. It's only when we want to attempt to make something move on the screen that the frame weight question kicks in. In around 10 frames a second of animation, the psychological effect called apparent motion kicks in. And that's a sense of motion, a feeling that something is moving. But now the next real important question, how fast? Is it moving? See, a slow moving object that crawls across the screen will look smooth at 12 frames a second, whereas a fast moving object will jump and stutter, revealing the fact that it's made up of discrete frames. And there we hit our first point. In order to appear perfectly smooth and eliminate all stutter, each frame must move the image by no more than the smallest angular change humans can perceive, which is one arc minute or 0 0.016666 degrees, a 60th of a degree. Okay, let's put some numbers on it so you get some perspective. Say you're sitting in a movie theater, sitting near the front of the middle of the hall so that the screen occupies 55 degrees of your field of view. If you had the dot go from one side of the screen to the other, you would need 3,300 frames per second to make that dot appear to move perfectly smooth across the screen in one second. That's 55 degrees divided by 1 60th of a degree. Want to move it in half a second? Double that to 6,600 frames per second. Or what if you sat closer, thus increasing the angle of view? Or what if you were talking about VR or the futuristic holodeck? Now, with both eyes open, we have about 180 degrees of angular vision. Divide that by 1 60th, and that's 10,800 frames per second needed to perfectly move a dot from one edge of your vision to the other. 
double that, and we get around 20,000 FPS needed to move that dot in half a second, or say getting a dot to move 90 degrees in about a quarter of a second. There is no theoretical upper limit, but 20,000 frames per second feels like it would cover almost all possible scenarios. Now, if you want to get it all actually on me, yes, the visual acuity is only that fine in the center portion of our vision, the fovea. But then again, we never know what part of the path of the animation will cross our fovea unless we do eye tracing. But you know what? For the sake of this argument, don't worry about it. But here's the thing, if we did construct a screen and fed it 20,000 frames per second, what would that flying object actually look like, assuming we're not looking directly at it? Well, it would look like a blur. So why not lower the frame rate and add motion blur? Now in real life filmmaking, we don't need to add motion blur. It's part of the process of shooting an image. The shutter captures light coming off of a moving object over a period of time, which will naturally result in motion blur. The more motion blur, the lower the frame rate we can get away with. Now film motion picture adds another dimension capturing not all the blur, but only half of it or more or less. And I may make another video on that topic if there's enough interest. So cool, we can cheat a super high frame rate needed to simulate reality by introducing motion blur, right? Since fast moving objects are going to appear blurry anyways, using a lower frame rate and just blurring those moving objects will help us achieve simulated reality. Well, not really. Now here's an interesting bit of trivia. You cannot pan your eyes smoothly without fixating on something. Try it yourself and look around your room. If you scan a landscape, your eyes actually dart from feature to feature to feature to feature. There's no way to pan your eyes smoothly like you would pan a camera. Your eyes, however, can smoothly track a moving object, say like a wild antelope running across the Serengeti, or a noob running around that first person shooter that's popular right now. So let's start with a thought experiment. Let's say you have a cursor that's traveling across the screen that you are tracking with your eyes. As your eyes smoothly track the cursor across the screen, you're expecting the cursor to move smoothly as well. But as I'm fond of saying, nothing on the screen is actually moving. As your eyes move, the cursor, which has a discrete frame rate, is always in a state of catching up. This causes what I'm going to call eye tracking motion blur. Most literature out there just calls it motion blur, which is really confusing to the filmmaker in me. If you track an object with your eyes in the real world, that object will not have any motion blur. Your eyes match the speed of the object and it will look sharp. The background will blur, but the tracked object should not blur because it's not a discrete series of still images. But if you track an object on a screen, because the frame rate is not keeping up with your eyes movement, your tracking object will blur and that breaks realism. This is the titular subject of the seminal site, Blur Busters. And shout out and name dropped to them and many of the conversations I had with Mark Rajon, the chief Blur Buster. Again, the issue is a spatial question. And here Blur Busters has a simplified Blur Buster law for the minimum amount of motion blur. And it states, one millisecond of persistence equals one pixel of motion blur per 1000 pixels per second of motion. The eye tracking motion blur you experience can be caused by a whole host of other screen technology related issues. In my conversations with the chief blur buster, I realized that those are well above, well above my pay grade. So you may experience more motion blur than this, but this principle sets the absolute minimum amount of eye tracking motion blur you would experience. Let's break this down a bit. I know it's a little scary because it's, it's all math, but I, I think it will look very intuitive after a second here. If we have a cursor moving at 1000 pixels per second, it's moving at one pixel per millisecond, right? And if we hold the image on screen with the persistence of one millisecond, which would mean 1000 frames per second, if each frame was one millisecond, then we would have an eye tracking motion blur of one pixel. Let's draw this out. Our eye starts with a pixel at the time zero and begins moving. 
From the perspective of the moving eye, the pixel has a relative motion moving in the opposite direction. This creates a blur which lasts only one millisecond and has a distance of only one pixel. If that doesn't make sense, let's toss in some other numbers. Let's say we have a 10 millisecond persistence, which equates to 100 frames per second. As the eye travels, the frame holds for 10 milliseconds, generating a 10 pixel blur before the next frame comes up. Hopefully that's starting to make a little more sense. But notice how we went from talking about angle of view to pixels. That leads to the question, is one pixel motion blur visible? The answer to that would be based on your spatial visual acuity and the distance between you and the screen. Again, throwing out more numbers so you get some perspective. If you were looking at a 27 inch monitor from 3.4 feet away, that would give you roughly 30 degrees field of view. If the resolution was 1920 by 1080, each single pixel would be 0 0.0156 degrees, just a bit smaller than the 0 0.01666 repeating single arc minute that we used for our max visual acuity earlier. So at 1000 FPS, the eye induced motion blur of an object traveling at 1000 pixels per second, like what I'm showing on this screen right now, would be the, at the limit of human perception given that we're watching it on a 27 inch monitor from 3.4 feet away. Of course, those numbers change if you make the screen bigger or move this object even faster. Though I think there's probably a limit on how fast you can track something before it just gets too hard to keep in your eyes. Still, 1000 FPS sounds like a good starting place to eliminate eye tracking motion blur. But just like before, there is a hack. The Blur Busters law mentioned persistence, not frame rate. If we flash the image on screen for one millisecond and then remove the image, leaving only black for the say the next three milliseconds, we could reduce the effective frame rate down to 250 frames per second while still keeping the exact same one pixel minimum motion blur. This process on modern displays is called black frame insertion or BFI. The most recent process from Nvidia is called ULMB and that some commenter made me aware of. They have to, they have to always address it in the comments. ULMB stands for ultra low motion blur, essentially doing the same thing. Let's go back to that drawing. The pixel is visible for that very first microsecond, but as the eye is moving, we go to black. There's nothing to register in the next following three microseconds until the next frame shows up. You still have that minimum one pixel motion blur, but we've quartered the frame rate needed from 1000 to 250. Now this is also why CRT monitors, which only have a single line ever lit up, have a very low eye tracking motion blur issues. The phosphors on a CRT glow for only two milliseconds before fading to black. And because the rate of this black frame insertion is so fast, it's well above the flicker fusion threshold. So you shouldn't see any flickering. Although lower refresh rate BFI does exist and it does become noticeable, especially when it starts reaching close to 60 Hertz, which is right on the edge of our critical flicker fusion. Another downside to BFI is image brightness. Now, because the image is not on screen for the entirety of the refresh cycle, the picture will look much darker, but at least there won't be any eye tracking motion blur. Great news, right? Well, we've come to an impasse. We can use BFI to lower the frame rates to eliminate eye tracking motion blur, but with those lower frame rates, now we see the stutter in parts of the frame where we're not tracking with our eyes. If we use added or natural motion blur to smooth out the motion of non-tracked or fixed gaze viewing, then when we try to track an object with our eyes, that object will be blurry, which wouldn't be real life. So with lower frame rates, say sub 1000 FPS, you have to pick one or the other. Do you want objects tracking with your eyes to be smooth, or do you want the entire frame to be smooth when using a fixed gaze? The only way to both eliminate eye tracking motion blur and the stuttering when using fixed gaze is to brute force it with frame rate. 
1000 FPS might be good enough on a smallish monitor with a reasonably fast motion, nothing going up, moving faster than a thousand pixels per second, please. But the larger the screen in both size and appearance and the faster the movement, well, yeah, 20,000 frames per second would probably cover most of it. Now that's the basics of how to simulate reality. Now, as a 24 FPS devotee, let me just take a side note on why filmmakers might actually appreciate the 1000 Hertz display. Not for shooting at stupidly high frame rates, I'm against that, but for better ways of displaying 24 FPS content. With 1000 frames to work with, we can simulate actual three bladed projector flickering, if you are into that kind of thing. Or you can finally control the gray to gray image response and reduce the 24 FPS judder. I may do a video on the topic why high performance gaming monitors actually make 24 FPS movies look worse. The simplest answer I've been able to gotten is it's in the gray to gray response. The thing is, no one claims that 24 FPS simulates reality. That's why we filmmakers still use it and why we still love it. But it needs to be treated differently on the latest technologically advanced displays. Hopefully between these last two videos, you've gotten a little bit broader view on the interplay of biology and the effects of discrete frame rates. I'll be honest, it's interesting for sure, but I'm ready to get back to telling stories through motion picture. Throw a like and subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Let YouTube know you're not all just watching shorts. Hey, you made this far in this long form video. Toss a coin into my Patreon if you're so inclined and check us out below in the merch store. Get some neat, cool filmmaker IQ gear. All that stuff for me to say is to go out there, make something great using frame rate. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.